markets, speculation, and risk. This is the Chat with Traders podcast, hosted by Aaron Fifield. Welcome back, traders. I am Aaron Fifield, and thank you for joining me. This is episode 203. Today, my guest is the great and legendary Bob Bright. Though, unless you follow high stakes poker or you were maybe a prop trader during the 90s or early 2000s, it's likely you're unfamiliar with this man. In short, it was 1974 when Bob threw in a corporate job, moved his family out to Las Vegas and went all in on blackjack. Four years later, having consistently beat the casinos, Bob went on to the Pacific Exchange in California and traded options on the floor. Then in 1992, Bob and a partner formed Bright Trading, a prop firm which at its peak was home to 490 traders across 42 offices in the United States. Bright Trading still exists today, but on a much smaller scale. Now at 80 years of age, Bob remains an active market trader and he is also a serious high-stakes poker player. In fact, if you Google Bob, the only photos you'll find are of him sitting in front of stacks of chips at various casino tables. I might also add, if you've heard my interviews with Blair Hull and Edward Thorpe, you'll notice that Bob's story has similar parallels. Over the next 60 minutes, you'll hear Bob speak on pivotal moments from more than 40 years trading and gambling, his dependence on betting with a mathematical edge, which leads into what he's trading nowadays, leveraged ETFs against non-leveraged ETFs. If you do happen to get confused by some of the things Bob is describing uh, on this subject around leveraged ETFs, I've included a link in the show notes which may help with some additional context. And then we finish it off with some talk of discipline and managing tilt. After this interview, you know, personally, I felt like Bob perhaps had a little bit more to give. I thought I might have been able to tap in, extract some more wisdom, but it's like occasionally my questions weren't quite connecting. Regardless, it was an absolute honor to chat with Bob, and I hope you'll dig the episode. Ladies and gents, here is Bob Bright. I believe it was the year 1974. It's when you left a corporate job after having worked there for 12 years, packed everything up, moved your family to Las Vegas and decided that you were going to become a full-time blackjack gambler. How confident were you that this was a good idea? Uh, Pretty confident. I had uh, for about eight months tested out uh, poker in California and blackjack in Las Vegas on weekends. And I did not run into any real poker players that had much money. Uh, A lot of top poker players in California I ran into, but uh, I could tell they didn't really have much in the way of money. If they had a bad week, they were struggling. Uh, The blackjack, uh, after reading books and getting a little bit of tutoring, I was able to uh, win that without a big problem. So uh, the, the uh, playing, biz- playing Blackjack as a Business is the book I read that uh, worked for me. And I uh, came to Las Vegas and had a weekend workshop with a guy that was teaching people that. And at that time, that was in 1973, I believe. And he um, charged $100 for a weekend, which is pretty low cost. But he had 12 people, and uh, he, back in those days, it was he'd put on the screen uh, that would play on the wall. Uh, two cards would come up, and your cards would come up, and then you had to tell him what was the proper thing to do because he told everybody they had to study. Well, out of the 12 people, 10 of them, he told them, uh, come back. Uh, I'm keeping your 100, and yet next time, study before you come here because uh, people from New York and everywhere had come into the uh, uh, workshop he had, and two of us stayed then for the weekend, and we learned a lot, and uh, uh, I used that methodology for four years and made enough money to get into the stock market, and the the casinos 
were happy that I left Las Vegas. <laughs> so <laughs> that was uh, that that was a, an experience. So that was twelve, you know, over four years of on my own with blackjack. The twelve years in the, the that I worked when I got out of college was with a large corporation, and I worked myself up to a finance uh, controller for a multi plant location. And then uh, the uh, uh, next way up was a, a division controller job, and I checked everybody's profile, and they all graduated from Yale or Harvard and some of the prestigious schools, and I did not, and decided time for me to move on and do it on my own. Why would I work for somebody all my life? So that's what I did. Moved to Las Vegas. I had three young kids and uh, a wife that had, was going to go anywhere with me, so we uh, – we enjoyed it for four years, and uh, I ran into a few uh, other card counters, and we met every once in a while to sharpen our skills. And but we never recognized each other in a casino. If you saw one of the other card counters, you'd always never say a word to them in a casino because that's how they find out if you're, you know, part of the the people that beat them. And they didn't. They don't like people that beat the casinos, so. But, but since then, it's been a, a nice ride uh, since 1974 when I finally left my one-time one -time job. Luckily, I haven't had to work for anybody else uh, since then. So I guess that's been, what, 40, 46 years. Quite some time, yeah. So you had this methodology for when you came into playing blackjack um, that you'd sort of been going over a little bit. When it actually came time to put it into practice, you know, in 1974, once you really committed to this, were you actually a good card counter from the outset or did you struggle a little bit to make a reasonable living in the beginning? No, I, I actually, uh, 1973, came to Vegas quite often on weekends and counted cards. I, I read the book originally probably early 73 or early 19 or sometime in 72 so I was always interested in it. My brother had worked in Las Vegas as a dealer, not a blackjack dealer, but a, a dice dealer So uh, for a number of years. So I was familiar with Vegas, and once I understood the book, it was fairly simple to do card counting. And uh, I came down with $3,000 in my pocket and uh, had to rent a house <laughs> and uh, that was uh, my biggest expense, and then I went out and tried to play very small stakes blackjack and did that for about seven months before I could jump into a little bigger stakes because I was playing $5 chips uh, for seven or eight months and finally got to the point where I could play the $25 chips, and then, then I finally started making enough money to where it kind of grew from there, and then I had a, about three and a half years to accumulate enough money to go get involved with the uh, stock market. I've heard you tell the story about how you went out one weekend with the intentions of making enough money from your winnings that you could then buy a house in cash and you pretty much did minus a couple grand. Uh, you were short, but was that during your first year? No, that was in the, um, uh, I think about the I was two or two and a half years into it. It was in 1976, I believe. And I was getting so-called, I was getting tailed quite often from the casino. Security people would follow me to my car, write down my license number, things like that. Uh, if you win in Las Vegas, uh, they tend to want to know more about you. And, of course, I lived in Las Vegas with a Las Vegas uh, uh, license plate and everything. It got to be where, okay, I had to move to, I figured I had to move back into California and drive up on weekends or move to Utah, which was 100 miles up the road, uh, and I decided to buy a house. We found one uh, about 105 miles from Las Vegas in uh, southern Utah, and uh, for two years, uh, it worked out for me and for the uh, security of the casino because now I had an out-of-state driver's license, uh, out-of-state uh, license plate, and I could pretend to be a high roller and uh, sit there and drink 
uh, alcohol and play chips and uh, vary my bet to go along with the card counting and act a little bit tipsy and play all night and they wouldn't bother me because they knew I was out, you know, they, they did not understand that I had basically lived in Las Vegas for two years. They didn't realize that. And uh, I just happened to come in from out of state and check into a hotel for a weekend. And instead of having to play uh, two or three shifts a day, you know, I used to put in about three hours on every shift, uh, almost seven days a week when I first started. But in 1976 and 78 and 78 through 19 late 78, I only had to work on weekends and it, uh, made more money and less, less so-called, uh, uh, heat by the casino. So that, that worked out pretty well. Then I had enough money to go into the stock market. I went and got interviewed uh, at a, one of the stock exchanges and they said, well, what makes you think you don't know how to trade stocks? And I said, well, I don't, but I, I will learn. <laughs> and, uh, uh, it, it was ended up on the options exchange and, uh, well, they asked me, well, how are you going to trade options? I said, I'd, I'd, I'd figure it out. I'd uh, pl probably play it the same way I did the mathematics with blackjack. And they said, well, you know, why don't you talk to this so-and-so guy who he's, he he's also was a major blackjack player, and now he has a good operation here. So I did, and we he turned out he turned out to be a pretty good player. And I, I understand from Rob that you have interviewed him by the name of Blair Hull. I was just going to uh, say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he and I uh, worked together on the Pacific Stock Exchange for about uh, three or four years. And then he went on to Chicago and then he retired for a while. And then I went on to Chicago and and he found out what I was doing. So he contacted me and uh, came back to Chicago and uh, uh, grew a infrastructure of what he really wanted to do. And uh, he's done very well with his life, and uh, I, and I have too. And we both enjoy, you know, that period of time. And he's a, uh, uh, you you know him well. I was, Bob told me you had a, quite a long interview with him, but uh, he he helped me a little bit when I first got involved with the options. And he already had something with a kind of a 360 baud modem or something that uh, you can get some computer work done on the uh, option uh, models. And back in those days, in the late 70s, uh, not many people had those kind of things. So we th that's how I made money in uh, doing options for quite a few years. And, and then in 1984, I moved to Chicago and got into futures and the bigger options has changed there. And Eventually, in 1992, I started a, my own trading firm uh, when I was doing equities. Uh, I started doing equities then because a friend of mine told me that uh, he was the second person on the West Coast to be shown how to do equities from what they called upstairs. You did not have to be on the trading floor up until uh, the early 90s. You could not trade equities uh, or options. Uh, unless you were on the trading floor. And uh, he wanted me to come over to his office, for, and I did for a while, and I was impressed with what he was doing. And the problem was he learned how to make money trading equities in a, with a computer in an office without being on the trading floor, but he didn't have the capital. And I had a, a, lot, a lot of capital, so we joined forces and started Bright Trading. And... Um, Went to Chicago, and uh, from that point on, it, we, we grew to a pretty large firm, and uh, we're still around. Uh, we didn't get involved with high-frequency trading, and now there's a few firms out there with high-frequency, but we love having a proprietary trading firm, and uh, that, that went very well, 1992 uh, to now, and we're still still thriving with a number of uh, some of the best of the best are still with us. Uh, and we have a, a, a firm that uh, we enjoy d dealing with the traders and uh, doing trades. I enjoy doing the trades. I bought my partner out there in 2003. Uh, he got bored when things started going the other direction because he was a, 
uh, his half of the partnership was he would find the managers to manage the building and do all the construction and electrical work to get offices going. And we had 42 different uh, trading rooms going at one time. And now we only have a couple. So people now trade from home. You can trade from anywhere. You can use your phone from anywhere in the world and trade. And a lot's changed. I've seen a lot of technology change in the last uh, number of years. I bet. I bet. Um, so you've covered a lot of ground there. I think you sort of summarized close to maybe 30 years just then. I'd like to dissect a few of those things uh, a little more. Uh, first of all, I was just curious, when you were still in Las Vegas, uh, did you ever cross paths with Blair Hull uh, at that time before you you know, later worked together or had some sort of um, thing going on uh, at the Pacific Exchange? No, uh, he was at the exchange uh, before me, and I didn't cross paths with him. I crossed paths with a guy by the name of Ken Houston, who wrote a book, The uh, Big Player. And he uh, also was uh, uh, like an IT manager at the Pacific Stock Exchange. And he would come to Vegas on weekends, and he had a team that played and uh, it was uh, probably 19, let's see, what year would that have been? That would have been about 1977, 76, 77. And he was the best known blackjack card counter then. Uh, he, had, he had high profile. He'd always re- turn around and tell uh, reporters in town how he did, and probably embellished a little bit on that. But he had a, a smart team that he brought in from California every weekend. And uh, I joined forces with him for a month. And we went around the world and played blackjack a little bit. He taught me everything about team play. And I taught him how to play lone wolf. And that was our agreement. When we got back to Las Vegas, uh, we uh, played about one more week. And then uh, I told him, okay, we we've, we've, we've both met our our goal of learning a lot from each other and I'm going to go back on my own and be a lone wolf. And he said, well, nobody's ever quit my team before. I said, well, I can make more money as a lone wolf. So (laughs) he went on and became uh, one of the most famous blackjack players prior to uh, when uh, some of those college kids got in from the East coast, Uh, MIT team got in about 10 years after he did, he had a team going here for quite some time. I never decided to get into team play. I'd like to be the lone wolf and play. I play my own my own money and uh, not worry about other people. And that's how I did it with the blackjack, and that's how I did it with options for many years until uh, 1992 when I decided to start a firm and um, kind of grew because it was the right time. People were now leaving the trading floor. Uh, where a friend of mine who had stayed in San Francisco and I had gone to Chicago, he said, well, come back and visit me and I'll show you what we're doing and maybe uh, we can get together and start a, start a business. And we did. And it worked out very well. When you first arrived at the Pacific Exchange, I understand that you were predominantly trading options your big thing is having an edge, and I presume this is sort of ingrained in you from playing blackjack originally. Where did you find an edge in trading options uh, to begin with? Well, back in those days, it was very simple. Uh, you would uh, buy to the left, sell to the right. We had printed uh, reports that we got from uh, Blair Hull, who had a little operation going where he was selling to about a uh, half dozen people the mathematical model of what the fair value of option uh, models are. And we were trading stocks with it. We were doing stocks and uh, calls and puts. And most people that did options back then, in fact, the first year I did it in 1978, um, most there was not hardly any puts being done. It was mostly calls. But the uh, the idea was it was pretty simple. If they, somebody comes in and wants to buy uh, calls or puts, you just look on your printout and you're able to 
to do it. It, it didn't take long before you can you learn to do it in your head anyway. But options versus stock, you, with, with a call and a put combination, you can actually do synthetic stocks. And I don't know if you're familiar with that, but a lot of traders might be. Where if you buy a call, sell a put, it's the same thing as buying a stock. And sometimes you can buy a call, sell a put, and you end up with a, a, a price of the stock lower than the price of that stock's trading for. And then you turn around and sell the stock, and you lock in a, a, some free money. Uh, or you can do the reverse of that. There's what, what you call conversions or reverse conversions. And back in those days, in the late 70s and most of 1980s and early 90s, uh, that was how a lot of uh, professional traders made their money. But since then, everybody's gotten involved with computers, and uh, seldom do you see things out of line enough to be able to do the, th the three-sided to where you lock in these profits without any risk. So what year did you transition to computerized trading? And I presume this probably forced you to adapt a little bit. I mean, I'm not sure if you were able to continue doing those same sort of trades uh, once things became computerized. Rather than get involved with high frequency uh, automated computers with auto, you know, artificial intelligence and have uh, that do the trades for you, I decided not to invest in that. And uh, it was still, I'm still a point and click type trader, but I, uh, and I, I'm not a good analyst. But I find where there's mathematical edges is by looking at these things, and, uh, and that's why I still point and click. And very few people now, a lot of our best traders uh, have uh, what AI, and they will maybe send in a few hundred stocks for the opening and and get things done based on some AI pro programming that they've done and. And then they don't trade too much during the day, and then they do a market on close and get out of everything. Uh, there's various niches in the market anymore, and you can do it with a lot of uh, letting the computer do all the work for you, and you got to do a lot of homework to get the computer the information that's needed, or you just do it yourself with uh, a niche that you may have in the market, and that changes periodically based on uh things like uh, interest rates and things like that you got to uh follow it. you know you got to understand you, once you understand how the clearing firms make their money and the brokerage firms make their money uh you find a way to where you can also make your money as a professional trader so that's uh but you still got to pay the piper a little bit because my clearing firm is Goldman Sachs and I've been with them Ever since 1978, when we started with uh, uh, them or, or a, a company that they had bought, they bought numerous companies that I had been with. I, I never changed firms. I started with one firm, and then another firm bought them, and then another firm bought them, and then Goldman bought them. So I've been with Goldman ever since 78, more or less, and uh, I've learned how clearing firms and how it changes, make their money, and how a proprietary a broker can make money, and how retail brokers make money. I never cared for the retail brokerage. There's always such a, uh, what you call handcuffs for traders that want to work retail. That you got to almost be into a proprietary situation to where you're not limited to the so-called pattern day trading rule with all the rules of the uh, SEC and FINRA. Uh, as a proprietary trader, you have to take a lot of tests and so they know what you're doing. And then uh, once you get all the tests passed, you're, you're pretty much eligible to do what you or your firm wants to do as long as it also the clearing firm that you're clearing with is, is allowing you to do what, what you want to do. So that's pretty much... It took a while over the years, over the decades, to learn to do that, and I'm still doing it. Yeah. Well, I'd love to spend a little bit of time talking about, I don't know if strategy is the right word, but really understanding a bit more about how you trade. Now, I understand uh, perhaps today you aren't quite as active. You're still very active, but not to the extent that you were 
uh, you know, the past kind of 30, 40 years. Maybe if we talk about when you were kind of at your peak, really active and heavily involved day trading, if we were to come into your office during that time and we were to watch over your shoulder uh, for the trading session, I mean, what sort of trades would we see you putting on? Like, what what would that be like? Well, things have changed a lot from those days. In, in those days, the rules uh, were a lot different than they are today. Uh, if you have a stock like, uh, say, it's forty dollars, and uh, it might well, there was a while there for the first few years they traded by eights of a dollar, then they went to a teeny of a dollar, one sixteen. Uh, and then they eventually went to pennies. But the point is, uh, you could put in, say a stock was $41 uh, bid and $41 and five cent offer or $42 offer even. Uh, but you, you could also put in offers above the offer. And then if some institution came in and wanted to buy 100,000 shares when only a few hundred million are traded that day, uh, they, they might be willing to pay forty-three dollars for it, and say you had a forty-two ten offer, forty-two twenty, forty-two thirty, forty-two forty offer, and if they came in and bought a big block of stock at forty-three, you would get paid forty-three dollars. Uh, they changed the rules over the years to where now you don't get that money. Uh, they get every price that you've had in as an offer now. Uh, and that changed many years ago. So those are one of the bigger edges we had back year, years ago. So you can't talk to the same in now versus the 1980s, even though the uh, computer has taken over a lot of information that you that you can uh, have alerts and you don't have to be watching everything. You can have a, I have a buzzer that I put a lot of alerts in. And when something buzzes, I look to see what it is and then I know what to do. And it's uh, the heyday was when there were certain types of things done, even in the 80s and 90s, a lot of people did not understand all options at all. They didn't understand how the, a three-way, you can do a synthetic stock versus a regular stock and lock in a profit. And uh, so, you know, now, you know, major operations, major firms have uh, automatic computers for that with AI and everything else. So. Uh, things have changed, but there's still a niche for people that find the niche that they like. Well, I still do probably anywhere from 20,000 to two or 300,000 shares a day, but it, they're selective trades, and it's mostly mathematics with so-called leverage uh, products. I use the leverage ETFs, and you have to know uh, how that works, and the uh, I, I like the math, the mathematic way of making money, not the smart way of being a, a good analyst and knowing exactly what a company does and count the number of trucks that go in and out of their factories and the boxes of uh, product in and out and all that. I just like to play the math. And when you play leverage ETFs, uh, that leverage factor allows you to make money just because of the mathematics of leverage. Can you... Uh, go into that with a little more detail. What is it about leveraged ETFs that appeals to you? Well, let me give you an example. Uh, let's say that um, uh, you, you pick one of those products, and that particular product, it could be a financial ETF, it could be a leverage, uh, a double or a triple. And what that means is it will move two or three times. A double will move double, a, a triple will move three times the value that the underlying product moves. So, therefore, if you have a product of $100, a particular ETF, uh, you can uh, sell it. It goes, it, Say it goes up 1% a day and you sell it. Uh, you sell the one side and you also sell the other side. You can sell the short, you can sell the, sell the long. So, you're actually selling. Uh, let's just, for a good example, is say, over a period of, uh, uh, say, three or four months, uh, it goes up 10% and down 10%. Well, if, uh, if you did the regular ETF, uh, you start at $100 and you end up with $100. But 
But if you do it with leverage, you take a hundred dollar product and you short the long and it goes up to 130 because it's triple, right? It goes up 10%, so 10, 10, and 10. So it goes up to 130 and you've shorted it. And while well, you're losing on that side, but you're uh, shorting the other side too, where the it goes uh, down 10 percent, down to 90, 80, 70. So now you got now let's just say over the next period of time it drops 10 percent. So th now 10 percent of 130, as an example, is not 10 points. 10 percent of 130 is 13 points. So it drops 13, 13, 13. So that $100 product goes back to $91. And you started at $100, shorting it. Uh, so now you're, it's back to 91 on on the sell long side. On the sell short side, it went the other way, down to 70 But now it goes back up 10%. And it doesn't go up from 70 to 80 to 90 to 100 It goes up 10% of 70 which is 7 three times. So now that 70 goes up to 91. So now you got the product that is has given you 9% mathematical edge strictly because it moved around during a period, any period of time. Uh, there's other factors you have to consider, but it went up 10%, down 10%. And here in March, there were some of the products that had done that in a matter of a day or two. And think about it, when you have a 10% movement on a triple you're actually if it goes up 10 percent one day down 10 percent the next day and now you've got 91 price on it instead of 100 you just made yourself nine percent so that's what i mean by mathematic game i just it's similar to any of the mathematical blackjack games or mathematical poker games you got you have to find where the edge is now there's other to it other things to it you got to put in a beta of the product that you're trying to trade over a long period of time, you know, what's the beta of it and the long-term uh, movement that you can anticipate and you kind of factor the math into that. But in simplicity, to keep it simple, it's strictly uh, the professional short these products and the, uh, the retail buy those products. And in the prospectus, it actually advises you never – buy them for more than a day or two because you lose money over time because they will de decay in value. But, uh, you know, the, the, the very few people will take the risk to short these products, and uh, that's where the professionalism comes in and understanding the math. So essentially what you're doing is exploiting the tracking error of these leveraged ETFs. Well, it's, it's a mathematical, it's not an error. It's a mathematical, real mathematical game. Kind of like blackjack is a real mathematical game. So if, if, if say, IBM goes up 10% and then back down 10%, and if you're guaranteed to make money on it, uh, why not? So how long have you been trading these leveraged ETFs for? Like, when did you come across this niche? Well, uh, when I first did it, it was probably 10 or 12 years ago. Okay. Uh, and I did it for a while, and then... I've, Found out the clearing firm knew it better than I did, and uh, as I was making money as the market, you know, it zigs around. It moves up a half, down a quarter, up a half, down a third, uh, or a point, you know, and it moves all over. And they charge you not what they call imputed value of interest and locate money to provide this product with you so that you can short it because you're shorting both sides of the ETF. So that you're paying a fee for that, and they can move that interest, imputed interest of value around. Uh, if a lot of people started doing it, then they have to go out and borrow more from institutions that might own it. And these leveraged products, nobody, no, hardly anybody owns it long term. So there's, there's a constant battle. One day they, they might charge you an annualized two and a half percent, another day an annualized eight percent, or and you really got to watch the math that is being charged to you. So the first year I did that, I put a bunch of money into it and I thought I was making out pretty good. I checked it out. I was up two and a half million and I looked at the math of what the clearing firm made from me and they made three million from me. So I just <laughs> said, well, I 
tried to negotiate with them that I would continue doing it, but they had to cut back a little bit on what they were charging me. And after some discussions, they decided not to cut back. So I just uh, closed everything. And I had like a hundred million dollars going on at that time. And uh, within two days, I closed it down. Then they called me and they said, well, how come you close everything? I said, because you wouldn't negotiate with me. So we could both make money. So I'm not going to play any game that you are the only one that makes money. What is the duration of these trades before you gave, in your example, you spoke about kind of 10% moves, um, you know, 10% moves don't happen too frequently uh, during one day. Um, are you trading this over multiple days, like these positions or these trades, do they have a duration of multiple days or are you trading these through, you know, smaller movements on an intraday basis? No, you, you can put a position on uh, that, that would be a perpetual position. And periodically, if the clearing firm is charging too much to secure the long ETF for you, then you would reduce it periodically. So you're, you know, the way the market works, one day you might be up 1%, and then the next day you're up a half a percent. And then the next day it's down three quarters of 1%. And when I say it's up 10%, down 10%, the reality is over a long period of time, most of these products or most ETFs, well, the, the market itself is up about 6 or 7% and, uh, on an annual basis. So you got to factor the mathematics into that. you got to look at the beta of the type of product you've got. And you also got to watch what you're getting charged or when they're charging you a locate fee and an interest rate fee. So basically that's what I do anymore rather than spend time doing a lot of uh, work like we used to do where their rules favored proprietary traders. I just try to trade the leveraged products that the rules, you know, the rules haven't changed. Those that short it and can maintain it and carry a, a position for a number of weeks, days, years, whatever, uh, you shouldn't make money unless you don't have enough volatility. Now this, since February, late February, we've had some pretty good volatility in the global markets. Uh, there, prior to that, last year, uh, so in uh, 2019, I actually closed, I, I had it up to maybe 30, 40 million and dropped it down to less than 5 million because there was little volatility. If you don't have the volatility, you better start to get out of the position. If you have high volatility, you just have to manage it a lot. And you can't really do that if you don't have enough knowledge of how the math works. There's a lot of information on those kind of products, and you're warned about it in the prospectus. Of the products are made for retail to buy. What they don't tell you in the prospectus is that professionals – tend to sell them. Mm. So what do you do in those periods where volatility does drop off? Do you have other uh, niches which you've found to exploit? Well, I, I really don't like getting too involved with other issues other than I have done it with REITs and different things where they pay uh, pretty good dividends and high value real estate uh, I, I actually, I'm not a good analyst, so I don't uh, like to dig into all that. And I never really made a lot of money doing it because it, you'd always find out that the, uh, the the people that were putting together these products or REITs, sometimes they don't align them that their their business model with the uh, uh, investors. And uh, I didn't know that. Uh, they're not supposed to do that, but, you know, any, any business you get in, you, you better hope that whoever you're doing business with is aligned with uh, your part of that industry also so that you both make money. And when people put together a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, if they're not aligned with the buyers of those trusts, uh, they they will try to make management money that kind of defeats the ability for you as an investor to make money. And there's always been some people writing on those kind of things, but 
Uh, I don't like to get too involved with anything other than the mathematics, so I don't have to deal with uh, people that have other uh, interest in what they're doing, that, rather than just the model that they say they're, they're doing. And that's sort of what I've done over the years with blackjack or poker or stock market. you got to understand what the other people in the industry, uh, what are they doing? They're not there to just make it nice for you. They're there to make profit. I believe in capitalism. And you, you, rather than dig into um, like IBM or a car company or whatever to see what they're doing and all that, I, I just I'd like to dig into what the clearing firm does or what the brokerage firm does. How do they make money? You know, they compete against other brokerage firms. They make money by selling order flow. They make money by charging their own customers. They make money by doing uh, sub-penny trades that you can't do if you're not a broker. With, you can do sub-penny trades with uh, your own customer, uh, but you can't you can't do it otherwise. Uh, so there's all kinds of different rules and regulations that favor the uh, big banks of the world and the clearing firms and the broker dealers and then the proprietary traders that have taken all the tests and understand a lot of that so that you can't go back on the SEC or something and say, well, I didn't know about that. Uh, you believe me, they, they have some tough tests for people to get involved with uh, proprietary trading. And anybody trying to do short-term trades really should become a proprietary trader, not a retail trader, because there's a, a world of difference. Before when you gave the example of uh, the edge you've discovered uh, trading around these leveraged ETFs, um, I mean, that, that was a great example of an edge you've discovered. I'd really like to speak with you more broadly about edge, just the subject of having edge. For you, what does it mean to have an edge in trading markets? Well, in trading markets, you have to have an edge that you know in the long run will make you money and that you're not just feeding uh, a brokerage firm uh, or feeding an, an exchange. The exchange makes their money by selling the information of the quotes. Uh, the clearing firm will make money by charging interest. Uh, they will take a margin account and take the stock that somebody has in a margin account and uh, lend it out to other people. And then they charge a fee for that. They don't give you that fee if you're the margin account person. They keep that fee. So there's all kinds of little ways that clearing firms make money. There's all kinds of ways that exchanges make money. There's all kinds of ways that uh, some firms will buy and sell order flow. So you got to understand all that. Once you understand it, uh, then you pick out the niche that you want to do. And for the most part, most people that have a mathematical or any kind of a real edge will want to get around the pattern day trading rule, which allows only about, about six to one leverage. And you can get around that because you get tested, you become a professional, you get uh, whatever your bro uh, broker dealer will allow you to do because you're actually using their fir the firm's funds. You put up uh, some seed capital. We have people that put up 50000 or 100000 We give them a million or two to play with, but we monitor very closely what they're doing. But it, it, it gives leverage. So even on a small edge, you might have a half of 1% edge, but if you're leveraging it 20 times, that's a 10% return. Uh, so you got to prove yourself to be able to do that. But that's uh, what an edge is all about. You don't have to have a big edge. In blackjack, for the most part, you hardly ever had more than a 1% edge. And I, I did pretty well sometimes when it was strictly a half a percent edge or a quarter of a percent edge because you can leverage yourself more by increasing your bet size when it's – when it's a 1% edge versus when it's a negative 1% uh, edge. And you, you move, that's how casinos used to catch you. They'd watch your bet size. And now they have uh, artificial intelligence that does that with a 
video taking a picture of what you're doing and it's also card counting and if your bet size is always higher when you have a so-called positive count and always a low bet when you have a uh you know a down a, a negative count uh pretty soon you're going to get tapped on the shoulder and asked to uh why don't you play another game because uh, this game's not for you uh at least in our casino so uh, we love to have you here, but we can't let you play blackjack because you play too well. And that's that's part of the business. And these days, I understand that's happening in the brokerage business, too. You may have run into it where you, I don't know about Australia, but in the U.S., a whole lot of the Internet firms have gone to zero commissions. And that's because they sell the order flow. But if you're too good with the, your orders, if you you know they will find out, uh, and the people that buy that order flow from them will find out who is really a good uh, trader, and they're going to say, oh, we don't want that guy's trades. You know, they they start to bar him just like they they use the casino model. If you're too good playing against them, then they don't want you. You know, go down the road, play with somebody else. I might just rephrase that question a little bit um, and, and sort of put a slightly different spin on it. For newer traders, let's say, what are some considerations for how they could seek out an edge in trading markets? Well, they have to have a niche that they enjoy doing. An edge could be that they have worked in an industry for 20 years and they know everything about it. They uh, have contacts within the industry. They can make phone calls and find out some of the things that is public knowledge, uh, you know, I'm not talking inside information or anything. That's one way of knowing about, you know, as some of the top people will tell you that trade what you know, trade the industry you know. Uh, you got to know uh, that the more trucks that go in and out of a factory uh, will tell you something. It's a lot of data that you need to find. find. Uh that's why they have quants these days that are providing all that data for you, and you can pay to get that kind of data. But still, so many people have now gathered data based on such things as uh, cardboard boxes and trucks going in and out of factories and you know, trying to guesstimate how the business is, uh, that it's not near the edge it used to be. But th that's an edge if you know your industry. If you have a background in the construction industry, you know uh, if lumber goes up or down in price, you know how that's going to affect uh, retail construction. Uh, there, so there's those kind of ways. And then there's the mathematical kind of ways of like banks. They, for the most part, will want to lend long and borrow short. And they borrow money at lower interest rates and lend it out at higher interest rates. And everything seems to be kind of turned upside down in the last couple of years. In fact, since uh, about six years ago, when Europe started going this negative interest rates, or Japan did actually 20 years ago, uh, we now have negative interest rates. So the the yield curve is you know kind of sloped a little different than it used to be. But it used to be pretty simple for banks. Uh, they would lend long term. Uh, you know, they'd borrow short term, you know, pay 2%, 3% to borrow money and lend it out long term at 6% on a long term mortgage. Uh, that's that kind of edge has disappeared and rightfully so. These days, there's a lot of information out there and everybody has apps and uh, cell phones to get any kind of information they want. You just go to Google and get whatever information you want. So the competition on a global basis for mathematical games, uh, you have to be a little more smarter than they were uh, even 15 years ago. You go back 30 years ago, uh, banks really didn't understand, you know, they didn't know their own business, but they knew how to make money. It was easy to make money when you borrow at 3% and lend it out at 6% and leverage yourself. Uh, it's not kind of hard to lose money doing that. How about the traders who came through the door of bright trading? Like how were they encouraged to find an edge in trading? We try to work with people. If they don't have a 
a niche that they want to, that they think they have an edge, you know, would work with them. Uh, we work with a firm that called Stock Odds that has a database uh, for use. Uh, our traders are able to use it uh, for free. They, they, they charge uh, quite a fee for most people that uh, are not with our firm. But with, if they're with our firm, um, you can get that f- uh, without any additional cost. And it's a large database. And say you want to hedge yourself all the time, and which we recommend that you hedge yourself all the time. I would not short a triple uh, ETF on one side without shorting the other side. If you short the long, the long side, short the short side also. And it's just like I would not short GM without looking for another car manufacturer in a similar basis to go long. You know, you might buy GM, sell Ford or whatever. You're going to find those kind of things to hedge yourself, to give yourself leverage with the small edge that you have. And if you have a, a good knowledge of the uh, regular automobile industry, you can make some good money with some good uh, hedging uh, with what we call pairs. And that's you have to have a, a methodology or database to be able to get that. And that that's there's some you know you don't need a big edge. You just need to leverage yourself on the edge you have. So pairs trading was quite popular amongst uh, bright traders when it was at its peak. Well, trading was very popular, and uh, we started the firm in 92 when they started leaving the trading floors. Uh, luckily, I had experience in options and futures and equities up until that time, and then when people started hearing about us, uh, they did not want, necessarily want to be on a trading floor. Can we come to your office and trade from your office, really? And uh, sure, come on in, we'll, we'll show you what to do, and uh, here's what it costs, and we we'll try to help you, and uh, for the most part, people that don't have preconceived ideas about what way the market's going to go uh, will usually do pretty well with a niche that they can find for themselves, something they enjoy doing. If they know on, uh, for the most part, on Monday mornings or on the last day of the month, uh, certain things happen that don't happen the other days, they're going to play those kind of uh, t- transactions. So everybody has their uh, uh, niche. We, we taught, we, for the most part, we taught everybody how to do pair trading back 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If you didn't know how to do pair trading, uh, how are you going to get leverage on yourself? You have to do pair trading, trade a pair so you can take a small edge of, say, a half of 1% and turn it into a 5% edge because you can leverage yourself with enough size to be able to get that uh, that half a percent uh, to a multiple, so that's you know sort of what we've done. We grew to 500 traders, 490 traders, I think, at one time, and uh, 42 trading rooms around the U.S. and a few people around the globe. And since then, uh, artificial intelligence, high-speed, high-frequency trading firms have gotten in. Uh, you're probably aware of Cynadel and some of those that. It's really hard to beat them when they have uh, micro seconds to, uh, to you know, they, they might do 20,000 orders in a second. And uh, when you're trying to do s- trading, you if you don't have uh, our AI and high-speed computer and have a server right next to the venue you're trading with, uh, you, you better have an, another edge. And... Uh, that's what I do is try to just always try to have an edge, whether it's blackjack, poker, or options, or stocks, or a combination of everything. Mm. Uh, just a, a couple more questions for you, Bob. This one on the subject of mindset uh, and, and probably more specifically discipline. Uh, when I was preparing a few notes um, for this interview we're doing at the moment, Um, I came across this quote, I think you were quoted in an article of some sort, and you said something along the lines of there were a lot of people trying to count cards at the time. Uh, The problem was 95% of the people that tried to count would lose eventually anyway. They couldn't handle the discipline. And I thought that was quite interesting because uh, discipline is obviously a big factor in trading success as well. 
Can you speak to the importance of discipline and how you've managed to maintain a, a good level of discipline with your, your own trading and your own uh, gambling? Well, I, I learned the discipline back when I first started playing blackjack. <laughs> uh, you, you better have discipline in any kind of a gambling game. Uh, you might know you have a 1% edge in blackjack, but time after time, hour after hour, they keep beating you. And you, you get these runs once in a while, same way in poker, same way in the stock market. We just ran up uh, here in the U.S., I think, eight days in a row. And today, finally, it went to a downside. Well, how many, how often does you, you go from a 300 plus point upside to a, to a downside market in the same day? Not that often, but, and, and if you try to, if you don't have the discipline to say something is changing during the trading day or the trading week or the trading month, then you're going to lose money. And that's what happens. There's all kinds of different things, but you really need that discipline with those three uh, areas of blackjack, poker, and trading. When I say trading, that's whether really you're trading futures equities, options, whatever it is, you have to understand what you're doing and not get upset. Things happen. You stay disciplined. Um, so if you can't stay disciplined, then, you know, you get stubborn and you think you know more than the overall market does. The capital markets will defeat you every time. If you think you know more about uh, that you should get a blackjack because the book says so. Every 21 hands, you should get a blackjack, and you've played eight hours and haven't had one. Uh, now you're getting angry, and if you get upset, uh, that blackjack's going to beat you. So you, you have to know what to look for and not get angry when things happen. Uh, when it comes back in the day in the 1970s and 60s, uh, actually, in the 70s, uh, there were some shady things that went on in some of the gambling casinos around the world. Most of that's all been cleared up, but uh, uh, I play high-stakes poker. I would not play high-stakes poker if I didn't have uh, monitors, uh, you know, cameras on every every game that I would be playing with. Uh, I learned that the first day I moved to Vegas. I got into a poker game and caught some people with some shady dealings and uh, of course, you know, they, they knew I caught them and they didn't invite me back and I never would ever again play a private game in Las Vegas. I, I trust the casinos that they lose their license if they get caught with anything shady. So I always like to have their license uh, there on the line when I'm playing within their casino because I know that if they do anything shady, they're apt to lose their license and I'm only going to lose a little bit of money. I guess this ties in as well to tilt and tilt's obviously a popular term amongst poker. You play a lot of poker um, and that term is also kind of used by many traders as well. How do you avoid or at least manage tilt in trading and or poker? Well, because I've played blackjack, I've played a lot of poker and yes, tilt is something in poker. Uh, that is more prevalent in poker because more people talk about it. There uh, is also tilt in trading. You, ca you can't let tilt uh, get to you. In poker, you better not because other players on a table, if you got an eight or nine-handed table, there's going to be at least one or two players that will make comments purposely to try to get you on tilt. And you got to be able to know that and not... Uh, allow that to happen. Uh, there's, uh, you know, in, in the capital markets, it just happens. Things happen. Long-term capital took billions of dollars and lost it, but they, you know, they, they thought they wanted to hang on and hang on and uh, not recognizing that uh, things do change. You have to recognize when something changes. And it was a, a not a shady situation. It was just uh, something back when I think it was 90, 1998 where something changed with the global uh, interest rates. But those kind of things happen. Just like the COVID uh, virus uh, in March, uh, the whole world kind of went way, way down and uh, it happens. So you better be prepared and not over. When I say use the leverage you can afford to do, don't over leverage. 
don't get upset because something happens like a new disease out there. Everybody uh, should know that roughly every 100 years or more often, these kind of uh, viruses come along. So you can't get upset. You know, recessions come along. You can't get upset when you, you ride a bull market up and then all of a sudden you get into a bear market. Uh, you better recognize it within a few days anyway or a few weeks. Don't just hang on for the next three years while you go into a giant bear market. And that's really, you know, I, I guess I gained that in the 70s when I played blackjack. You could not get upset just because you weren't getting good cards and the dealer was getting all the aces and you were not getting any. Uh, same way in the capital markets. Uh, it's it's if you know it's an honest game, just make sure you know uh, where your edge is and study your edge. Uh, make notes at the end of the day of what you did right, what you did wrong. And bef before you know it, you'd find out, oh, gee, I, I went on tilt. I didn't realize that. I went on tilt midday because I did this, and it was the wrong thing to do, and I didn't recognize it at first, but then I had done it, and I kept doing it uh, because I wanted to get even. Well. You learn those things after a few decades or a few years of any kind of an industry that is risk-taking. Trading is a big risk-taking. So you have to – so, we, you know, back in the day, and I'm talking 10, 15 years ago, we had a lot of training classes with new traders that came in and would teach them how to not go on tilt, how to have a game plan, how to have a journal, uh, study all they could about things, not just what the regulations say, but also the trading. You have to understand, uh, you know, our, our website uh, goes along with that pretty well, where we clear up a lot of stuff by just looking at our website that traders need, but most of them don't know they need it. When you go to some private broker dealer for retail, they're not going to they don't care if you know anything. Just send us your money and you can trade. But uh, if you want to be a proprietary trader, you have to have a game plan. And, I, you know, I would say check us out at stocktrading.com and take a look at our website and some of the things that we tell you that you should be checking into before you uh, change careers or before you get in heavily involved with any kind of a trading situation. So... Uh, that's I've done that for many years uh, with stock trading, and we captured that stocktrading.com website years ago, and it's been nice for us. And we've got an alliance with uh, Stock Odds, another firm that provides databases for our traders, and we have one one of the premier clearing firms that clears all our trades, and that's Goldman Sachs. And um, you got to bring to the table. Uh, a little bit of seed capital would give you a lot more capital to play with, but you have to understand the rules and pass the test or the regulators won't let you do it. They want to know that you know the uh, all the uh, SEC-type regulations before you're allowed to have that kind of leverage that a proprietary firm can allow you to have. Bob, just one last question to take us out here. Uh, and I'm quite interested to hear your answer on this. Do you have any self-imposed trading rules that you live by, which have served you well over the years? I, I, I'm not sure I know what you're saying. Uh, we, we don't have any preconceived ideas. Everybody has an edge one way or another based on their life's experience, but they have to have the discipline, as you mentioned, they, in order to pr trade proprietary trading, uh, that allows you leverage that retail doesn't. You have to have an understanding of the industry. There's a test for that. You have to have an understanding of the products you're trading. And you have to have the uh, discipline and methodology of how do you're going to do it. Whether you're going to do it with an automated computer system or you're going to point and click uh, with, with a single PC or... Uh, you're going to flip a coin uh, every Monday you're going to do this, this and every Friday you're going to do that I, I don't know You know, he, I, I've given up on trying to talk people into uh, 
forgetting that edge because that doesn't make any sense because sometimes they tell you, well, it's, it's worked for me for 40 years, so I'm going to continue doing it. And I, sometimes I see that, that, hey, it still works for this guy. Whatever works for you, you got to understand it. Don't copy somebody else if you don't know exactly what they're doing. I've seen people, well, Joe, he, he makes money all the time, and he let me watch him, so I just did what he did, but I, I lost money, and he made money. How did that happen? Well, because he didn't teach you everything that he was looking at. You have to know what's behind why he buys and sells at the instant he does it, and you, you, know, you have to understand what you are doing. So that's, uh, you know, I've taught, uh, we used to have, like every two weeks, it'd be a 40 people class that I would try to get involved with. And my brother ran it back years and years ago. Uh, I mean, like 15, 20 years ago, I'd go in for an hour or two uh, in a week. But uh, he was there constantly for a full week to drum into people's heads that they have. It comes from them. A trader has to know what he's getting into. It's not a flip of the coin. Nothing, nothing in life is, really is. Is that anything else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that kind of answers it. I mean, I was more thinking along the lines of, what's a good example? You know, there, there's some people who will say, you know, if I have three or four losing days in a row, then I might cut my position size. I might reduce my risk um, to prevent, like, further drawdown, et cetera. Well, that's that. That's not a bad policy. Uh, that's just an certainly. example. I was more just wondering if you had some sort of, you know, some rules like that, or I'll never risk, you know, more than X percent or et cetera. For the most part, I, I don't use that rule. I learned in blackjack, you don't use that rule. When things are going bad and you're pretty darn sure you got a fair game, you get higher leverage if you're losing. So when I walk into a blackjack table, I hope I lose the first 15 minutes. Because now they let you bet with bigger bet ratios. If you're betting anywhere from $10 to $50 and you're losing, 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 now you're betting from 25 to 500 and, and you're still losing, now you get to bet from 100 to 1,000 or you know, up to $2,000 or more. And they don't bat an eye because they've seen you lose, lose, lose. And so I don't buy into always reducing, not in blackjack. Uh, in poker, yes, you might, if you're going uh, quite a long time in poker and you're losing in a particular table and you don't know all the players, uh, you probably better cut down because maybe some of the players are better than you that you, and you're not aware of it. Uh, it's okay to play with players better than you. If you're aware of it and you know that you have some knowledge of that player and some of his idiosyncrasies and some of the reasons he goes on tilt and you will know when he does go on tilt then you stay around and you work it but uh, the game but you if, if you can't figure out uh, where the edge is eventually going to come to you in a poker game it's best to cut back and cut back until you say well this game's just not for me i'm going to move to another table or or give it up for the day in the capital markets when you lose three or four days in a row uh, that's why you should keep a journal at the end of the day, write down the things you did good, the things you did bad. And after th three or four days, you have three or four days in a row and you're losing money. You don't necessarily want to cut your risk and cut your leverage, but you might. If you haven't figured out that the market has just changed due to some uh, capital market situations, Either gold went up or oil went way down or up or, you know, some commodity happened or some, something happened in the world that changed the capital markets. If you can put your finger on that, there's no reason to change your leverage. You might move it around a little bit. But if you can't figure out what changed, then I go along with the idea of reducing your leverage. Okay. All right, Bob. Well, let's leave it there. I must say I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, speak with me this afternoon. Uh, it's It's been quite an honor. So uh, thanks very much. Okay, you're welcome, Aaron. And uh, thank you for the podcast. And uh, I, hope, I hope you get uh, some of your traders to understand uh, how to make more, you know, don't get upset. Don't go on tilt. Get that edge and make some money. I'm sure. I'm sure. No, it's been, it's been really great. Uh, what's on this evening? Do you have a poker game lined up? 
No, th these days there's so much happening in Las Vegas with all the COVID-19 that, you know, we get a lot of tourists, so there's still a problem in Vegas that a lot of the poker tables are not uh, in action. Uh, and there's so much with the volatility. The volatility is great, greater than it's been in years, so I'm taking advantage of it, and I'm trading uh, anywhere from 6 to 12 hours a day with the high volatility. And it's... Uh, I get plenty of action, uh, and it keeps keeps the days going by pretty fast without having to leave the house too often. Uh, I don't know how it is in Australia, but here in the United States, uh, there's a lot of hot spots, and uh, Nevada happens to be one of those hot spots these days uh, because we do we we our industry, casino industry, uh, thrives on uh, tourists all the time, and you never know how many are. Uh, already sick by the time they get here and they're here to have a good time they're not here to uh be nice and wear a mask and not you know get into a party mood so we have to be extra careful in casinos these days and i haven't really gone in many casinos at all in the last uh, since march i uh, flew back from uh, one of uh, our really large poker games in russia in uh, march and uh that was the last uh cash poker game I've played. Uh, early March, we uh, decided to get a private plane back to England and get back uh, British Air from there to the uh, U.S. before they uh, close the borders on uh, uh, you know other countries, people from coming. Uh, since we were U.S. citizens, we could have got, you know, we got in, the, uh, the, uh, me and some friends got in the, the last day that we could get back without having to go through a whole quarantine thing and everything. And uh, since then, no poker, but it's been a lot of nice uh, trading. Oh, right, right. Yeah, well, I guess that's the that's the nice thing. You've got plenty of uh, action to take advantage of in the markets. So uh, good stuff. Hopefully you can get back to playing poker soon enough as well. Bob, I'll let you enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you once again. It's been a real honor. Okay. You've reached the end of this episode of Chat with Traders, but rest assured there are more episodes loaded with real market insight and zero hype on the way soon. So to stay updated with each great new release, subscribe to the podcast and iTunes, and we'd love it if you'd leave a rating and review. We'll catch you next time on Chat with Traders.